Welcome to the Mad Dad Movie Review, a podcast full of first-time movie reviews starring Mads and her dad. I'm Mads. And I'm her dad. And this is Mad Dad Movie How goes it, kids and heroes, and welcome to a special edition of Mad Dad Movie Review, where today I am joined by special guest host Elena Tully from the Crazy Train Radio podcast. Her and I are going to be doing something special today, something different. Um, What we're going to be talking about is a particular subgenre of everyone's favorite decade, the 1980s. Um, I figured... We could just bunch in a bunch, talk about the whole decade overall, and then center on a few of uh, – not a few. It's actually five particular standout films, five films that I consider the cream of the crop, the most popular ones of the 80s decade. That's what we're going to be doing today. And without further ado, I would like to welcome this Elena Tully to the show. How are you doing today, Elena? Hi, Ed. What's the crack? <laughs> <laughs> well, how's it going on your side everything's going great the crack is good um yeah before we kick it off i want to let everyone know they can check out previous episodes of the show on itunes spotify google pandora iHeartRadio, pocket Casts, and wherever else they enjoy their favorite shows check us out on facebook.com at mad dad movie review instagram.com at mad dad movie review youtube.com at mad dad movie review and finally twitter.com at mad dad movie pod and of course if you have any questions comments or requests you can always email them to mad dad movie review at gmail.com all right let's do some shout outs I want to shout out your podcast, you, you and Jonathan, Crazy Train Radio. This past weekend, Jonathan put together this uh, food drive event that lasted three days, and I was able to participate in a couple of days worth of material. And I had a really good time. Uh, from what I understand, you guys were able to put together a pretty penny, um, more than what he was expecting. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, It was a great event. It was a good time. I went to a great cause. I had a really good time doing a couple of the interviews and participating in a couple of the watch-alongs. And so, yeah, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that and um, shout out to Jonathan and Crazy Train Radio in general. Uh, How about you, Elena? Do you have anyone you want to talk about or anything? Yeah, I was just – I was – just going to shout out Jonathan as well like I'm actually like awesome. blown aw- away with um he's he has such a big heart and it, it just was really touching to see that he actually got um more acknowledgement than than he thought he would and it's very um touching to know that we did help some people in some way and it, it was a great event and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make all of them because of time difference as usual yeah um, right I did try to pop in when I could, and I, from what I could see, it, it went down very well, and it was a lot of fun, and it's, um, it's so great to, like, talk to people who have the same interests, and, you know, it's like a little family, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be co-host on Crazy Tra- Train Radio, because the opportunities and everything, it's just, it, in times like this, this is all we have, we need to, like, look yeah. after each other and support each other and find things that give us joy and make us happy and I'm just so grateful that I have this opportunity and I hope I can you know contribute in a positive way and uh you know all that stuff so shout out to Jonathan thanks Jonathan for giving me the co-host job and (laughs) well done on the event absolutely yeah and and to piggyback on what you just said like i i'll take this to my grave the horror community in general it's just the best community there is like there's just there's no community out there with a bigger heart than of all things the horror community you know it's it, it's the community that people look at from the outside looking in and it's like the hell's going on there They're a bunch of scary looking fellas but in reality 
we're the real deal. We're the ones putting on stuff like this and looking out for one another. And, you know, it's uh, there's no other community I'd rather be a part of than this big, hard community that I've been a part of pretty much all my life. You know, it's I, I love it to death. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's start with the episode. I have an overview I put together. Basically, ever since the 1920s with Nosferatu, the vampire subgenre has been represented in cinema with so many different varieties. Whether it's the more traditional take, as seen in 1931's Dracula, starting Bela Lugosi, for Universal. The Hammer series, as seen in 1958's Dracula, starring the great Christopher Lee. The comedy side of things, like 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, Mel Brooks' Dracula Dead and Loving It, or the mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows from Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. The sci-fi variety, as seen in 1985's Life Force from Toby Hooper, and the more recent action type, as seen in Blade, John Carpenter's Vampires, and 30 Days of Night. Today, my guest host Elena and I will be zeroing in on the 1980s when the subgenre seemed to catch its second wind, and suddenly almost every year there was a different big vampire movie. We'll be focusing on five films in particular, 1983's The Hunger, 1985's Fright Night, 1986's Vamp, previous episode as well, 1987's The Lost Boys, and 1987's Near Dark. We'll break down and discuss each movie, talking about why each film stands out, our personal takes on them, and box office comparisons It's an idea that started as a piece of writing of mine, eventually being turned into a video idea for YouTube until the podcast started, and I decided to do an entire episode on it. This episode's been a long time coming for me, and I'm so happy to finally be doing it. Shall we begin? Sure, can't wait. All right, cool. Well, let's start with Fright Night. What would you do if you accidentally discovered the house next door was occupied by something not human? Something horrifying. Something unspeakably evil. No one believes you. Mom, I didn't have a nightmare. Not your mom. They did kill a girl over there. Not your girlfriend. Charlie, is this some sort of a trick to get me back? Not even the police. Look, I know it's crazy. I know that, but look, Lieutenant! It knows that you know. You'll do anything to protect yourself. But it will do anything to protect its secret. scared this could be the night of your life so <clears throat> fright night was released august 2nd 1985 from columbia pictures opening up in third place opening weekend box office was 6.1 million going on to gross 24.9 million dollars with a 9 million dollar budget got a rotten tomato score of 92 percent from 36 reviews and a letterbox score of 3.6 out of 5, directed by Tom Holland. It was also written for the screen by Tom Holland, starring Chris Sarandon as Jerry Dandridge, William Ragsdale as Charlie Brewster, Amanda Bierce as Amy, and Roddy McDowell as Peter Vincent. Fright Night. So I'll start with why I think this film, this film stands out, and then I'll give the floor to you so you can have your moment talking sure. about it. Okay, so Fright Night stands out from the rest because on top of being a vampire film, it's also a genuinely creepy haunted house movie, especially once the film enters the final act. Of all the major vampire films of the 80s, Fright Night's also the most respected with critics and popular enough that it was remade 10 years ago, and a very good remake as well. The practical effects also look the best when compared to other similar films of the subgenre, something that having the biggest budget also helps. 
Those reasons, along with the writing and acting, are why Fright Night is personally one of my favorite vampire flicks of the 1980s. So, what about you? What makes this this film stand out to you? What do you want to add to this? The floor is yours. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you there. Um, it was really nice kind of getting to rewatch these because I literally just did my homework extra because I'd seen all of these when I was a kid and I wasn't an 80s kid. I was born in the 90s. So when I saw these, I was only in my teenage years. And of course, half the stuff went over my head. Um, I was still right. a chicken, chicken shit at that stage. So I probably wasn't <laughs> watching half the stuff that um, I did. And, you know, it was really refreshing to watch um, some of them that I hadn't seen in so long with like a fresh pair of eyes and noticing things that impact me in a different way because obviously I really love the genre now and I can see it from different aspects like I want to be an actress myself so just seeing the acting but also what blows me away about um, these vampire movies if not the whole 80s horror genre is the special effects and oh, yeah. I feel like it was like the the decade that people are known for for that because they did everything themselves there was no cgi there was no over the top um you could really see how much effort goes into these things and it um for fright night in particular like just oh i get like the scene where um he's like i what i want to say he's like made but he's not he's made he's like a roommate or whatever in the house like when he dies like and all the the goo is coming out of him and he's like melting like acid and left with the skeleton that scene uh, as a kid that stayed with me but seeing it oh, yeah. again with new eyes i was like oh my god this is actually so cool and then it's, even yeah, when, it's cr- it's pretty gnarly looking yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about oh, awesome uh, yeah i know and i really love it too because it's like he is so suave like he's like the vampire you like to like like there's certain films that you're just like oh he's evil it's like no i I don't want anything to do with him i hope he dies but this guy is something about him that you're like yeah i can see how people you know would believe you (laughs) he's like the coolest vampire i think out of the the ones that we're going to be talking about i i really really liked chris sarandon in that um uh, otherwise, uh, I really liked that it kind of mixed comedy in it as well. So it wasn't, you know, as scary as I, as I remember as a kid. There was an awful lot that I was like, oh, my God, this is actually cheesy and, and cool, like with uh, Roddy McDowell, because I just yep. keep rem- remembering him from, uh, well, numerous things. But the one that sticks out in my head is Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, the Disney film with Angela Lansbury. And yes, I just keep, yes, exactly. I, I keep seeing him on the bike when he just comes to the house. <laughs> she's like do you mind yeah so exactly. uh, yeah it's it definitely you know you mentioned like you know emotion and 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 it gets you you feel things like for me one scene that stands out is um like when evil ed uh dies um it, it's watching it again recently it's really heartbreaking because like he's morphing back into human form and like yeah you, you feel for him and, and you know but um, yeah, you hit it right on the nose about Jerry. Uh, he he is the cool vampire. He is, um, and Chris Randon is awesome, as as well as the character. I love how he handles that apple. He's just something about the apple and the way he is because uh, he's a fruit. Because it's the whole play on he's like a, a a fruit bath, and that's why he's always eating fruit throughout the movie. Apparently, <laughs> it's it's funny things that you you know funny things you pick up on whenever you watch it. Um, it's just it's good stuff and and william ragsdale as the 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 next door neighbor that no one wants to believe um he plays it very believably and very well um and even amanda bears as his girlfriend who went on to be uh married with children just a completely different role just two years later uh she went from being just a high school girlfriend to like Al Bundy's next door neighbor <laughs> for 10 years. So it's crazy. Her, her face is definitely sticking in everybody's mind from this film, though. The oh, iconic God, know, smile man. is so cool. And the, 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 the story behind that is it, it's actually the exact opposite. It was a miserable experience for her, like to the point where she wanted that thing off and oh, no. to keep filming. And she was like, the look in her face, it was just real pain and tears, but they just wanted, you know, it's, it, it's, even though that was a decade of practical effects, it was also a decade of a lot of 
bumbling, half-assed practical effects. You know, people just doing whatever, just kind of throwing to the wall and seeing what would stick as far as like ideas would go, as far as to make the, the, the effects work. They would do that. Like, for example, like in the 80s, a lot of, a lot of like contact lenses that they wear, they're all glass. They're not like today. They were actually like thick and, and you could not see anything and they were painful. And that's like the characters, the vampires in this movie had to experience that grueling process. And yeah, I just heard nothing but horror stories for poor Amanda Bears uh, when making this movie. But for what it's worth, it paid off because you're right. Here we are talking about it 36 years later. It's definitely an effective scene that sticks in the back of your mind. For sure. Definitely. Yes. Um, so yeah, is there anything else about the movie that you, we want to talk about that you want to bring up? Um, it's pretty much, this movie, there's really nothing to it. It's, it's like I said, it's like you're, it's kind of a haunted house film with a lot of funny stuff. It's, it's your typical boy next door who cried wolf. That's the story really until the end when everyone sees that he's not lying after all. And, um, yeah, uh, it's just it's like I said, the movie was really well praised uh, of all the films that we're going to be talking about. This one got the best critic reception and um, it's the only one that garnished a remake. Uh, you know, they've been talking about remaking Lost Boys and Near Dark for years. Never came to fruition. Fright Night got a respectable remake. Did you see the remake? I actually didn't see the remake. I, I'm pretty sure did Colin Farrell star in the remake. Colin Farrell is Jerry Dandridge in the remake, correct? Right. Okay. And it, yeah. It, it, it's it's good. They changed the. The only real difference is because the the story is pretty much the same, except they made Peter Vincent like a Vegas Las Vegas novel act, like a stage act performance instead of a you know t- late night television host. Okay. And, and they also made the setting to they changed it to Las Vegas, so. He's like, Jerry lives in a neighborhood outside of the Las Vegas Strip. That's interesting. I wouldn't have put, put him in that part for sure. I know he's been like um, given a lot more diverse characters in later years instead of being a stupid Irish uh, <laughs> drunk the whole yeah. time. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Could he pull off Chris Sarandon's suaveness? But, you know, I might give it a watch just to see. But I have an awful feeling that it's just going to piss me off because a lot of horror remakes never tick the boxes for me. Don't no, get I... me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and I'm not because I'm the same way. But the, there's something about this remake that I, I and I've actually I saw in the theater because this was this came out when like 3d was all the rage everything was in 3d and this was no different so i was like at first when it was announced to be in 3d i was like christ i can see how seriously they're gonna take this movie they're gonna put out in 3d but i went and saw it i had my reservations saw it anyway liked it went back saw it again about two months ago i actually showed my daughter the original and the remake and thought it held up so Take that for what it's worth. Um, it's it's no original. It's not the original, but it's it's still it's a serviceable remake in my opinion. When especially when compared to the other flock of bullshit put out the last <laughs> ten years. <laughs> so, um, final thing, um, do you, out of five stars, what's your final star rating on this movie? What would you give it? Are we giving it stars or stakes? Oh, let's do stakes. I like that. Okay. I like that a lot. Um, uh, if I have to compare them to the, are we comparing them? Yeah. No, are we no, like comparing no. them out of all of them or just in general? Just your general opinion, your general okay. rating without comparing to anything else. Standalone. Four. Four? Four out of five, six. That's exactly what I gave this movie. Four out of five. So we're on the same page there. That is awesome. All right. So let's move on to another movie. A, I bet a different movie all together um talking about 1983's the hunger sarah roberts is in jeopardy hey lady how about it stay with her help her for she has begun to feel the awful horror of the hunger john blaylock the hunger 
has given him everlasting life. Until now, pray for him. Miriam Blaylock. She feeds one day in seven on the unsuspecting, and soon she will turn into something that you will never be able to forget. No matter how hard and how long you try, fear her. What have you done to me? Forever and ever. And life signs terminate right here. <laughs> The timeless beauty of Catherine Deneuve. The cruel elegance of David Bowie. The open sensuality of Susan Sarandon. Combined to create a modern classic of perverse fear. Haunting, mysterious, sensual, strange, perverse, riveting, the hunger. So this one was released on April 29th, 1983 from MGM UA Entertainment, opening up in fifth place uh, to $1.8 million, going on to gross $10.2 million, and I couldn't find a budget. So Rotten's made a score of 55% from 33 reviews and a letterbox score of 3.5 out of 5. It was directed by Tony Scott, written for the screen by Ivan Davis and Michael Thomas, starring Catherine Deneuve as Marion Blaylock, David Bowie as John Blaylock, Susan Sarandon as Sarah Roberts, and Cliff DeYoung as Tom Haver. What's most likely the lesser known film to everyone listening, there's a lot going for the hunger that are also bigger than the genre itself. First of all, this movie features David Bowie, who absolutely kills it in the short amount of screen time he's given. Of all the familiar films that are being discussed in this episode, The Hunker stands out for being the only vampire film without any actual traditional vampires. Instead, our lead bloodsuckers kill their victims with a bladed ankh pennant and then drink their blood. Lead actress Catherine Deneuve has her moments depending on the scene, but it's Susan Sarandon who truly stands out in this as Sarah, who is obsessed with eternal life all the while. Even though The Hunger can be too slow for some, I think the end result is a different kind of vampire film that makes things interesting by focusing more on the eternity side of things and not so much on vampires themselves. Kicking off your film with a 10-minute sequence set to Bauhaus's Bella Lugosi's Dead ain't a bad idea either. And did I mention this was also directed by Tony Scott in his directorial debut? So, what do you have to say about The Hunger? Which I'm curious the most uh, of all these films. I'm curious what your take on this film is. So go on. Oh. The floor is yours. Oh really? <laughs> that's that's a that's a. I didn't know you were really ex- uh, excited to hear me talk about this one. I because thought everybody. I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't mean to start, cut you off, but I don't. I don't really talk to a lot of people about this film, really. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I'm curious to hear what you thought. Sure. Well, I originally saw this uh, in my teenage years because uh, I, well, I still am a huge fan of her, but I'm a huge fan of Susan Sarandon and I kind of made it my mission uh, to see most of her work, if not all her work. That's kind of what I do when you like an actor, you kind of go, you delve into all their catalogue of work and you right. know, to see what they can do. So that was on the list and I saw it um, quite young, but I, I did rewatch it because I think uh, it's actually a beautiful film, although some parts really do kind of piss me off. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, even though there's not much dialogue for a long time, like the uh, the cinematography always gets me in this film. Like it's so beautiful. Like there's just scenes that are so well set up, uh, like just simple things of like the candles or just the, the curtains flowing or just little things like that. Even though there's like so many things going on, it, once without like talking it's just 
there's just so many beautiful shots like that. But I have to say, like, as a vampire film, it was definitely obscure compared to the, as you just touched on, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Stereotypical uh, bite in their neck, straight yes. off the bat, bangs yes. and yes. all that stuff. Really different. It's kind of like the, and it was very um, impacting for me to see the woman being like so powerful and she's the one uh, in charge and she calls the shots and it's the kind of, it's, yeah, it flips the kind of trope of it. And it, it um, the, I will say I hate Susan Sarandon's hair in it, but otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise she's, she's really good in it. And um, it just, yeah, it kind of touches on the whole, um, seduction side of it more because I don't know if you've seen American Horror Story it kind of brings vibes of that like when I watch season I think it's season five isn't it a hotel where um yes. Lady Lady Gaga's the Countess so I yes. kind of picked up um tributes to that um from the references of just you know the way that they go about it and they they seduce the people and then that's when they like you know take them or control them but it, it does it it has like I'm trying to like say it in a way that it doesn't ruin the film, but I feel like the film should have ended like 15 minutes before it did because the ending, uh, well, I later found out like when I went to research it because I, I Not went to the look original it, ending. Yeah. I went to kind of look it up online just to see, you know, uh, you know, types in the hunger, the ending explained because yep. <laughs> I was so confused. Because, and, it's, uh, because yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that was um, the studio kind of did that. They had their way with the ending of the film. And yeah, because that because believe me, Tony Scott's even expressed that he does not like that ending. That was not his idea. Yeah, that that's not what he was going for when he was making the movie. I read somewhere as well that they were planning or um, anticipating a sequel. So they kind of left it open. Right. To make it right. kind of, you know, a continuation if if they wanted to come back as the those characters, but it didn't it didn't make much sense. And I know I I it's saw a contradiction. with uh, with Susan. Yeah, I did hear her saying that she believed it should have ended then because she was so confused because no spoilers, but someone dies and then all of a sudden they're not dead, and it was kind of like the whole pivotal point of the story it, to it's, kind of. It's a- yeah, the, the final five minutes of the theatrical version of this movie, well, the only version you can see at that, yeah. either watch the film, the last five minutes, tune it out, or just shut it off before the, the last shot basically occurs, then you'll be fine. But yeah, you're right. And um, uh, the, the the shot, the, the curtains and everything you were talking about, the cinematography, um, I, I just want to second that because you hit the nail on the nose with that, especially all the shots upstairs in the attic. It is the creepiest visual with that blue and white light with the the, 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 the curtains draping, uh, flowing. Um, in fact, that this movie genuinely scares me for one reason in particular, and that's, you know, David Bowie's character and then what we eventually find out has happened to all of her husbands that they and wives live, they don't they don't live forever but they're they're stuck it's eternity they're stuck in this aging body they're not young forever eventually they're going to get older and to the point where it's just they can't even move but they're still alive and to me being locked in those crypts and those coffins like she goes and eventually when John her husband Bowie more about him in a second when he finally you know what happens to him she puts him in that box and it's like it is genuinely scary um, oh for sure that that scene stuck with me too but it also very progressive for the times to like actually say that she has wives as well so it's not just boys it's girls that she likes as well and there's a few girl skeletons or mummies at the end um in those uh, boxes i don't even know what you call them they're not crypts they're not coffins they're just <laughs> happens it's, to have 50 million boxes up in the yeah <laughs> yeah and she's got a lot so she's been busy for quite a while so and then like the whole end scene with, with what happens with all of them like not trying to get into spoiler territory like you said but yeah it's just that whole ending it's it, it's effective and then that final shot happens and it's like what the hell guys you know but um that's also my like something else that, that stands out is David Bowie's like got top billing. He's on the front cover of the movie, the poster and everything. But then 
about 20 minutes into the movie, he checks out and it's like, right. When's he coming back? And it's like, that's it. No, that's, that's the, that's the thing. That's the big reveal is like, he's done. Like that, your star of the movie, essentially the person we've been marketing this whole film around, he's only in it for like 25% of the film. <laughs> and it's kind of a jaw dropping moment. But once you get past that, this is a pretty good movie in my opinion. You know, it's, it's not as good as, others that we're going to be talking about but it's different and i i like it for trying um and like i said it's it i'm personally a big fan of um the late tony scott's career i find it just incredible that this was his first film because he went on to have a big career in the action genre but started it off with this so gotta respect that um, yeah, I know what you're saying about um, actors being, you know, they tried to sell the movie with a name or just to show the best bits on the on the trailer. So you watch it kind of thing. But uh, like, I think you did have a few more scenes more than what they're doing nowadays, because a lot of movies that I see now, it's like, oh, starring uh, such and such. And then they literally have a cameo as like a waiter or something really mundane, like walks in the door and walks out. And it's like, how dare you? fool me into watching this movie because all you did was like show them on the trailer for like one scene a paragraph of dialogue and then they're not in the movie oh yeah have you have you seen (laughs) have you seen the hunt no i haven't okay then i'm not gonna say anything (laughs) okay 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 okay, okay, why wait which which actor is supposed to be in that one (laughs) oh pretty much anyone that they've advertised uh yeah it's yeah, oh, right. uh, anyone who's seen the hunt that's listening to this episode yeah you know what i'm talking about like that the whole marketing for that movie went south real quick <laughs> so um okay the, um the effects are really good in that one too i must say like the just for his aging process is really good oh it's uh, great oh that makeup is so good um the that dick smith i believe did the makeup for that and um that's that's He's the go-to guy back then for the old person makeup and um, just top-notch job as always. So definitely. Um, before we go to our ratings, anything else you want to talk about? Um, I, do, I don't think so. I think I covered every aspect that it, it, it definitely stands out as being one of those uh, weird ones that you love to love kind of thing. Okay. It's like it had like just very, as I said, very powerful scenes without even talking just a lot of stuff going on, um, great effects, and yeah, just a, a good story if they didn't ruin it by <laughs> adding the extra bit at the end that makes no sense, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, what about your stakes? How many stakes are you going to give this? Uh, you see, now I don't know, can I get over the fact that they ruined the film by like pissing me off at the end? So I'm going <laughs> to get, I'm going to give it three. That's fair, that's fair. I gave my, I gave it three and a half. Right. Three and a half for me, and I think I think the half is more because it's got David Bowie, and I'm biased. But um, yeah, three and a half is fair for me, I, I think. And um, yeah. So our next movie is one that I'm also happy to be talking about. It's a movie that I previously covered on the podcast. Um, probably of all these movies we're going to be talking about today this is the most underrated of them all in my opinion and that is 1986's vamp did you ever have one of those nights Hey, where are we going? Ah, doesn't matter. What counts is that you're my buddy. <laughs> my day didn't start off too well. We be looking for ya. Are we chumpy tonight? And then it got worse. We're here. And then, gentlemen, I give you Katrina. You're just what I'm looking for. Why don't you pick on us? It was a mistake. It was a little error there, a little communication error. I'm sorry. Uh Uh-oh. Let's just 
get out of here. This is not really happening. Hello, baby. God, you look awful. What happened to you? I was nearly hung. I got into a fight with a psychotic albino. I ate a cockroach, my best friend disappeared, and then I'm nearly assassinated by a runaway elevator. Anyone can have an off night? This is fantastic! Vamp, a comedy with bites. All right, so and Vamp course, was released Grace on July Jones. 18th. 1986 from New World Pictures opening up in 11th place at 2.2 million dollars going on to gross 4.9 million dollars with a budget of 3.3 million got a Rotten Tomato score of 33% from 9 reviews a cinema score of C- and a letterbox score of three point one out of 5 directed by Richard Wink Written for the screen by Richard Wink and Donald P. Borchers. Starring Chris Makepeace as Keith, Robert Russler as AJ, Grace Jones as Katrina. Vamp is a vampire film that never takes itself seriously. Of all the vampire movies of the 80s, Vamp. It's also worth mentioning that Vamp features an appealing red-green lighting effect throughout that really pops and looks unique. All of the characters featured in Vamp stand out as well. There's Grace Jones as the silent head vampire. Chris Makepeace's Keith is your typical 80s dork of a hero, along with Robert Rustler doing his thing as the funny, outspoken best friend. Dee Dee Pfeiffer's Allison is kind of bumbling, but does so in such an adorable, jo- adorable way as Keith's love interest. Kitty Watanabe's here playing the lead, pl- playing his jolted character Duncan, and then there's Sandy Barron's Vegas obsessed character Vic who is the film's highlight, in my opinion. All in all, this is certainly the funniest vampire film of the 80s, but it's also one of the more underrated vampire films overall. If you want to hear more about Vamp, I implore you to check out our previous episode on the film from last October's Halloween Horrorthon. I host that episode solo and have plenty to say. All right, Elena. What do you got for us for Vamp as far as that goes? Well, I have to say that I did my homework and it was actually my first time watching Vamp. And with the the knowledge that I have now and just, you know, the eyes and the vision that I have, I can, um, I'm looking for certain certain things and I can, you know, appreciate the things that were done for the time. I... I have to say I liked it. I um, I immediately recognized uh, Robert from Nightmare on Elm Street too, and I was yes. like, I was like, okay, yeah, okay, I think I'm gonna like this now. <laughs> but uh, it um, it did. It made me giggle. I like. I really liked the effects. I thought they were good. Um, Grace Jones did freak me out, and <laughs> um, yeah, she she did a good job as being. I don't even know what you call her. She's not really a countess. She's just she's a pain. not even act. She's not even acting with like her words. She's acting like physically acting the whole. Her face, she has no yeah. dialogue. Yeah, definitely. Like the effects for her were really cool. Um, I have to say, like the scene in the in the sewer, that was really yes. cool. And um, seeing Judy Pfeiffer, because like I haven't seen her in much, but then I was really like, oh, it's Michelle Pfeiffer's sister. <laughs> it's like um, that was really cool to see and. Um, I'm trying to think, like, I did not really, like, as you pointed out, it was a comedy, it did make me laugh, and I thought it, it was a really cool idea just to have a random club in the middle of nowhere full of vampires. Yeah, um, there's, like, because it's, like, it's funny because when I watched the film for the first, not for the, when I watched the film recently for the episode back in October, after I watched it, because I, I picked up the Blu-ray, the air release, and watched that, plus the uh, documentary that's on there, which was really informative as well, they, um, first thing that came to mind was oh this is from dust till dawn which is funny that i mentioned that because apparently today the day we're recording this episode um it's the 25th anniversary of from dust till dawn so shout out to that movie um but yeah that movie right away was what i thought about when i saw this i'm like strip club full of vampires i wonder where this idea came from (laughs) and um even that the guy Vic who runs the club, he's obsessed with Las Vegas, Las Vegas for some reason, and it is the funniest gag. Like every time 
there's a scene where him and um, Chris Makepeace are at the bar together, and he brings up Vegas before he sets him on fire. And like his like reaction to like, "Whoa, you've been to Vegas!" like is the funniest thing, like the the, the funniest bit of that movie. Um, and then yeah, the what did you think of the red and green lighting, the color scheme? Because that was pretty obvious throughout the film. Oh, no, yeah, no, I totally noticed. It's like it kind of impacted me that way because immediately um, without digging too much into it, because I mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street, that's the first thing that popped into my head. Ah, uh, like, yeah, the colors, yeah, I Freddy. was like, the color is ready. But, uh, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know what else really to say about it. It was just, it had every um, every part of the formula that you can think of. It was it was slapstick. It was like, it, it was taking the piss out of being a serious vampire movie but there was some aspects that do genuinely um creep you out or, or try to do its job and, and it does because she she is a, a feared villain it's not like um fright night or whatever so you don't like her <laughs> it's an i didn't yeah, like yeah, her yeah. and i, I like, like how the movie also tries to start off like when it kicks off it's it tries to take itself like a serious horror movie but then it's revealed right. that it's just these two guys doing this stupid sorority gag um, I've and always they're, and they're that. a friend. I don't know what he's. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the actor's name. They're they're Asian friend who oh, joins. Gadi, them. Gadi Wantanabe is his name. He's uh he's from yeah. Sixteen Candles. Yeah, I I think he was the voice of uh, Ling and Mulan or something. I think I read that somewhere. I was okay. trying to do homework, but uh, yeah, it's in him. <laughs> I was really looking at uh, watching his character. I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna like this guy. And then by the end, I was like, oh my god, he's just too cringe. I have to like a laugh at him at this stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely, definitely cringe. Um, and then the two things well, before we uh, we wrap it up and get to our final stakes rating. The um, you, you, you this the moment. Spoiler alert: Grace Jones dies. The last thing you see is her skeleton flipping off um, yeah. teeth in them. So you know right there what kind of film this is when that happens. Like, okay, this film was never, ever from the word go meant to be taken seriously. The lead vampire is giving the guy the freaking finger, for Christ's sake, you know? When he, she finally, that's her like final breath moment is just, F you. Um, that's always got me. And then the final shot. The final shot is just too damn good with the two with uh, Keith and uh, Allison walking down the street to the traffic starting behind them while AJ is walking underneath um, AJ in, in the sewer. While they're walking the way like it's just the, it's early morning, the sun's coming up. And then as they're walking and the camera's still set on them, you see the traffic slowly start to open up and, and come out behind them. Because the reason for that is that was an actual take. They got the city of Vegas to actually, or, or LA to hold them streets at the crack of dawn for like, I think they had like 10 minutes. I think they said, or something like that. They had X amount of time to get the shot, but as they were conducting the shot, they had to let them go. And that was it. And that's why you see all uh, gradually the traffic starts as they're walking is because they ran out of time, but it still worked. You know, that's one, really of them, cool. one of them happy accidents. Yeah, one of those happy accidents. I, I really liked that as well when you touched on um, Grace Jones's death scene. That that really stuck out. Uh, very like it just it was very clever. Like when he's just um, punching the the light in or like it's <laughs> yeah. uh, so that and then she's trapped in the middle. That that was really cool. And just again to touch on eighties effects, like melting aspects or just all that stuff is so cool. Like it I wonder is, how. Really is. Oh, how many yeah. times or how long it takes to do that or how, how many takes like how many props do you have if it doesn't look right the first time it really really fascinates me those aspects of it um and it looks like i know some of it can look kind of stupid but i think that makes it look better because then you know people have done it themselves instead of stupid nowadays cgi that like it it's not the same anymore and i really really love the practical effects that people did back then that's what sells me um on 80s horror it really does like it's like they don't make them like they used to and no, they, they they, their characters are like so much more defined and you know you find yourself relating to them and i think that's why a lot of people um not just for bloods and blood and bloods <laughs> blood and guts and all that <laughs> stuff of horror it's like there is something you identify with the leads like all the hero characters i do anyway like a horror came into my life when um, I went through a, a lot of 
a lot of stuff, but I'm out on the good side now. But I remember um, telling some actors that I'd met over the years that um, their movies really, really impacted me and came into my life at a perfect time when I was trying to overcome some things. And then basically I ident- identified with, you know, the hero, the good and the bad. So it's kind of like you overcoming depression or something like that. That's what identified right. and really impacted me at that time. So it stuck with me. And now I can see these things and in different ways and I you know instead of being like a chicken shit kid all of these things are like so fascinating to me and as an inspiring actress it's um very very cool to see um leading ladies and stuff have such strong characteristics and stuff like that but that's oh yeah that's, absolutely that's the horror genre for me yeah. but yeah and also I want to know how long it took to paint Grace Jones in that random strip dance that she oh, like. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, apparently those cost those those costumes were she wore were hers or something. Right. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like she showed up wearing that one day, and they're like, "Okay, like this is what she's gonna do." We got no problems with it, I guess. Um, so yeah. Um, how about the 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 on blank steaks. <laughs> steaks your steaks how about your steak how many steaks are you going to give this one? Oh, hmm. <sighs> it's a tough one because i hmm. rate it however you want like don't rate it based yeah. on fully hard no, no. Like, rate it as your own thing okay on my own thing i'm gonna say three cool and just like the last movie i'm gonna give it three and a half just like to your three so <laughs> that's, that's fine you know this movie there's you know it ain't the perfect movie but it's far from the worst it's a fun film it's a funny film it's different you know and it stands out it really does anything else about uh, the movie all right as far as anything else i had to say if you want as far as vamp goes check out that episode i think i've mentioned it four times in this episode now uh moving on to our next movie Going to 1987's Near Dark. Honey, I'm gonna separate your head from your shoulders. Do it fast. All right. The time's wrong. Woo! No. You might as well just kill me then too. Caleb Colton no longer belongs to our world. We give him a week, see if we can call him one of us. He belongs to hers. But you have to learn to kill. He belongs to theirs. I don't want to kill. He makes a kill tonight. And they all belong to the night. It's three hours short for us to get home. You help me out? What are you on? Believe me, I told you. Don't think of it as killing. Amen. Amen. Don't think at all. If there's something that you do night after night, it's only ever a question of how. The nervous. I would be too if I were you. Near dark. It'll be your boys falling in with the rope. Check out time. Some time, son. I damage my family, let him go. Near dark. Pray <laughs> for daylight. The night has its price. Dale Laurentiis Entertainment Group opening up in thir- New York was released on October 2nd opening weekend box office $636,000 going on to gross $3.4 million on a budget of $5 million Rotten Tomatoes score of 88% from 49 reviews 
a meta score of 76 from 17 reviews and a letterbox score of 3.6 out of 5. This one's directed by Catherine Bigelow, written for the screen by Eric Red and Catherine Bigelow, starring Adrian Pastar as Caleb, Jenny Wright as May, Bill Paxton as Severin, and Lance Hendrickson as Jesse. Near Dark stands out because to me, it's the most mature of all the films. It's a Western movie, hands down, a Western with an incredibly smart and badass screenplay. Not to mention Catherine Bigelow's excellent direction. This film doesn't play coy or fuck around with its audience one bit. The violence is saved for when it's needed, instead giving us a captivating story to sink our teeth into, pun intended. Most people will think Twilight right away, but Near Dark did it first. Over 20 years ago to the first film, there's nothing boring about this film. So, Elena, I do believe we were talking. You mentioned this was this and Vamp were the two films you've never seen before. Right, that's correct. Yeah, it was my first time watching this one. And I have to say, yeah, I actually really liked this one. Um, Not just for the the cast members, because I I recognize and knew that those actors work, but just because it it kind of um, shocked me in a way that the others didn't do. It was more of a serious vibe and... I, I really enjoyed the the story and as you touched on the western aspects I definitely noticed that the the shots the yeah I'm trying to think like how to, to word it I genuinely did like all of their characteristics and characters I thought they were really cool and I have to say that um, I think that was probably one of my favorite Bill Paxton roles that I didn't know he did. Like I'm so used to seeing like Twister or Titanic or something like that. I genuinely right. did did not know that he was really cool at playing like the bad guy, which he he really really was really cool. And I I liked um I liked that. And then Lance Henriksen, he was he was really cool as well. And Oh, her name escapes me. You said it, but she's from Terminator Two and and Titanic, ironically as well. Um, I didn't say I didn't know that. I, I said Jenny Wright's name, but who you're talking about is Janine Goldberg. Right, Jan- right, right, Janine right. right. Gold- yeah. Janine Goldberg is her name, I believe. Yeah, right. Uh, just to, her, to see her as well. Um, she always has wacky hair and everything. But Janine, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Janine Goldstein is her name. Sorry. Yeah, she always has wacky hair, but uh, and yes. even the little. The little boy, like just um, aspects of that, that was really cool. Just to see um, a little boy being able to play such a dark little role, he must have had great crack altogether. And I recognize the other little girl, his sister, um, Beaches. On another note, is my favorite non horror film because I'm a huge Bette Midler fan. So I recognize that little girl as playing the young version of Hillary and Beaches. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, I like this film. <laughs> Wow. So I um yeah, I genuinely did like it. I had a I had a few questions though. I'm like oh, I don't want I don't no, want to spoil it. spoil the film for people who haven't seen it. But well, it's that's just, why we have these two yeah. wonderful words, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. But it's um yeah, it's like they they followed the kind of trope in a way, but then they kind of didn't. So it's like I've you know when he's he is a vampire and she's a vampire and then and then uh-huh. it just seems it just had a question in my head going so how did he turn back like is it like all of a sudden someone figures out that clean blood or whatever can he got, turn yeah back? it was a blood tra- okay yeah the the re- the the whole to to bring him back that whole ending it's it's a stretch it really is right but okay it's I mean that that's the idea that's what they're doing because his um. I think I believe his father, Caleb's father, is a veterinarian, a, a vet, a vet, veterinarian. I believe yeah. he says he is. So, I mean, how a vet learned to do a blood transfusion like that—that's <laughs> one thing. But we're gonna avoid that and just you're gonna suspend all, just hold all questions and just go with the flow. And that's the idea. It, basically, the idea is to switch out blood with his own, which okay. <laughs> Um, that's not really how blood cells work, but I mean, I, I see where your head's at with the writing and, you know, it's a movie about vampires. So I, I can bend a little bit from reality. So that's why I give it a pass, but yes, you, you'd be right. I mean, it is kind of a stretch, but I mean, it's either that or kill them. 
So, you know. Oh, <laughs> for sure. Or just the aspect of even, you know, obviously when sun sun burns them or whatever, and they're all at the same time uh, chasing each other at the end, and then somehow May is, like, completely fine, yet the little boy is, like, completely on fire. It's like, okay. Yeah, he is. But it, it no, it, it, it uh, out of all of them, um, I mentioned I really loved Fright Night. But I like from a serious note, I would have to say if you're looking for a serious kind of the that takes the the vampire uh, thing seriously in a in a dark sense, that there is no kind of piss take. These are actual vampires. <laughs> They're not like yeah comedy side. I I did like this film. I did, and I'm I'm happy I saw it because it was on my list for a while. I just didn't get around to doing that because I wasn't in exactly the vampire mood. But yeah, out of all the 80s ones, I'm, I'm actually super glad that I've seen it. And now I can understand quotes and, you know, references, especially the Bill Paxton stuff. Like, because like the name of this episode, We Keep Odd Hours. It's taken directly from Near Dark. It's my favorite line in that movie. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yes, it's something that Lance Hendrickson says towards the end. Um it's um yeah lance hendrickson i mean i don't want to get too biased because he's a guy i've actually uh met him and, and hung out Me with him too. at a convention and he's just i mean i'm i'm a cigarette smoker and so is he and him and i were at side of a hard convention we must have chain smoked like four or five cigarettes and talked about everything from dog day afternoon to his new book that he was there promoting that i bought and it was just one of my all-time favorite moments with any celebrity ever. And it was just two guys shooting the shit. He just happened to be out in the courtyard that I happened to be out you know, at a horror convention. And we just, you know, good good guy, so down to earth. I wish I could find that damn book. This was 10 years ago, but still, I got that book somewhere. He signed the thing for me, so I got to find that one of these days. But um, uh, I, that's lovely. I, I've met him twice myself, but by pure accident <laughs> myself, it was just coincidence. Like you just said, you just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was my my recent time meeting him was last year. It, well, not last year because that was 2020. I keep thinking it's still yeah. 2020. It was 2019 and um, I flew over to a con in Texas and I just happened to be there the night before the con, which I tend to do now because, unfortunately, the food in America, no offense, but I get sick and it um, takes me a couple of days to kind of get used to the food and get used to jet lag and all what, that stuff. What, what, side, sidebar real quick. Hang on. Um, yeah. As far as the I, I, OK, I'm not going to defend our food over here. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm going to clarify something. So you mentioned you went to Texas. Right. Texas to us, I'm I'm in I'm like 90 minutes south of Jonathan. I'm I'm still on the East Coast. I'm in Baltimore in Maryland. Now Texas, to me and everyone else on the Eastern Shore, and probably the majority of the country will say the same thing. Texas is is in its own category, in its own country of food, because <laughs> Texans. And if you're in the Texas area and you listen to this podcast, I apologize in advance if I hurt your feelings, but it's the truth. And you know it, I know it. Texas, they march to their own beat. They they are all about meats and 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 letting things cook for days at a time. They're all about barbecue and, and they're they're they they take that shit to heart. Like the whole Texas barbecue and stuff like that. Like and chili. Like it's like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's no different. You know, they're all about chili and meats and stuff like that. And like, it's Texas is it's Texas is unique. Okay, they're their own place. Um, they still they speak for us as a country, but they do their own thing as far as food goes. So you might have had I don't know what you ate, but um, you know, I'm I'm gonna. Uh, burst your little bubble there and say that I actually got sick nearly every time I went to the states, and I've been to a con in Chicago and Indianapolis. So well, it's, Chicago uh... <laughs> and Indianapolis are kind of close, and they're all about pizza. So no, no. And it, 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 then you know what? If you ever come over on this part of town to where Jonathan and I are, just don't eat, don't, don't eat, because <laughs> we specialize in seafood. Now, personally, I'm not a seafood guy, but where i am like this whole state they live by the crab i'm not a seafood guy but 
nine times uh, everywhere you go around this area where I'm from, you're going to get a seafood menu up where Jonathan is. He's around the Philadelphia area. You're probably going to get more of like a Philly cheesesteak kind of menu. Um, right. But yeah, it, it really, you know, and I'm sorry. I'm, and, you know, our food <laughs> sucks. I, it's, a, it's not your fault. It's like uh, I've recently found a kind of a cure, per se, inverted commas. The last time I was over, I was so grateful. I got my first speaking role in a film and we shot in Dallas and I was uh, in a film called Crave Roots of Evil, name drop. Uh, and I had a scene or, or one or two scenes, if depending how it's edited with um, Felissa Rose. So that was like the highlight of my life so far. So oh, as yeah. an actress, that is um, my it's pivotal Angel. thing that, that I will say. Uh, but yeah, the in Indianapolis was when I got so sick and not to like this your country again but I only had a toasted cheese sandwich and I think it might have been gone off at the same time because just food intolerance and whatever just blew it out of proportion I ended up in hospital I was in hospital what? for yeah I genuinely went to hospital and uh, I was so paranoid and upset because obviously I'd spent all the money to go over and look forward to this con and then I always right. get sick so people kind of know me at this stage that when I come over, it's like, Elena, don't eat anything. Or Elena, be, you know, be careful. And in the last time I went over when I was shooting the movie, I found these things called probiotic pills. So you take them mm. like two weeks in advance and then your stomach is kind of prepared. So I was very, very cautious. So unfortunately, I still suffer with a bit of food anxiety whenever I go traveling, which is understandable, but I'm slowly overcoming that, that I know that, you know, just take it easy. Don't jump in and eat everything that everybody else is eating just you know take a day or two on bananas and crackers and build yourself up kind of thing but now, yeah to go back, back to the story of where I met Lance it was just random at a at the con in Texas it was like the Thursday night so on the Thursday night usually if you've been to these events all the actors tend to go to the bar yes on the, on yes. the Thursday nights to kind of chill because they've just got in and they want to relax so I was lucky enough to hang around with the stars of Nightmare on Elm Street because I've met them a good few times at this stage so I was really excited to catch up with Heather again and I was in the middle of just a conversation with her I was like Heather was on my right and we were talking and Robert was on my left and we were talking and then all of a sudden Lance just comes over out of nowhere right beside me and Heather was talking to me and she's like and then all you hear is oh hi Lance and I just turned around oh. and I was like oh oh, hi, and then, like, literally shakes his hand and goes, hey, what's the crack? <laughs> That's awesome. So that was my that own story. Awesome. Hey, real quick, uh, before we get to the movie, now, you mentioned you were in Indianapolis for a convention. Uh, sure, yeah, it was, uh, was that Day, the, uh, Days of the Dead. Was that? Days of the Dead. I was going to say, was it Days of the Dead, or was it, my, or was it or, um, Horror Hound? It was Days of the Dead, unfortunately, because okay. they're gotcha. lovely people. <laughs> they just, it, was, it wasn't their fault. It was the whole No, time. I know. I know. I'll, I'm just curious because I know <laughs> yeah. Indianapolis have two big conventions over there. Yeah, so they do. Uh, and I, as an Irish person as well, I, I've even heard about that, that they're kind of like rivals across the town. That it's like if you sign with one of them, you can't go to the other one kind of thing. Well, so. I, can, I know this much um, without knowing a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. Indianapolis, uh, if... if um, Harhound, they've got the upper hand because 10 years ago they had Jamie Lee Curtis and that, that she's only the one convention her whole life and it was that one at Harhound. So right. Day of the Dead will never be Harhound because of the fact that the Harhound were able to snatch Jamie Lee Curtis for a one time only appearance. Right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she'll come back because I'm sure a lot more people will want to, to um, see her. Like, I don't know if you watched um, Scream Queens. I think she's absolutely I class. I watched it, yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm actually showing my friend that right now while I'm in his house, uh, kind of pet sitting and whatever. I was really like, you know, I have a, I have a craving to rewatch this. And it, it's so clever. It's so funny. I love Ryan Murphy and all that stuff. But Jamie Lee Curtis, like, it just, it's really nice to homage the genre and actually take the piss out of it at the same time. Well, but, then, <laughs> and then she came back, of course, for Halloween, and she's going to be in two more. Oh, Halloween, sure. So. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, yes. can, I can talk all day about that franchise, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll set that for another episode because I, I love me some Halloween. And um, yeah. So uh, back to Near Dark um, Steaks. How many steaks are you right. going to give this one? I'm actually going to give it four. Ah, uh, me too. Four stakes for both of us, definitely. And also um, bonus points because it's directed by a girl, which gives me, you know, 
real the oh yeah rich. right also the co-written too so yes yay women <laughs> And we can thank uh, James Cameron, Jim Cameron, whatever you want to call him, for this because they were together at this time. And right. uh, Lance, Bill, and uh, Janine Goldstein all came over from Aliens, which was J- James Cameron. And I'm pretty sure Janine and Bill ended up on Titanic. Correct. Mm-hmm. Where she played a fellow Irish woman. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> So, that leaves us to our last movie to talk about, the one that's probably the most popular with the general public, and that, of course, is 1987's The Lost Boys. Michael and Sam have just moved to Santa Carla, California. They're about to discover its secret. Notice anything unusual about Santa Carla yet? No. It's a pretty cool place. If you're a Martian. Or a vampire. Stay back! Stay back! What's happening, Star? Get yourself a good, sharp steak. Drive it right through his heart. You're a vampire, Michael! My own brother, a damn blood-sucking vampire! Oh, you eat till mom finds out, buddy! When a vampire bites it, it's never a pretty sight. Michael, they're coming! Oh, shit! All right, so Lost Boys was released July 31st, 1987 from Warner Brothers Pictures, opening up in second place with $52 million, going on to gross $32.2 million on an $8.5 million budget. It has a Rotten Tomato score of 76% from 67 reviews, a meta score of 63 from 16 reviews, a cinema score of A minus and a letterbox score of 3.6 out of 5. This one's directed by Joel Schumacher, written for the screen by Janice Fisher, Jeffrey Bohm, and James Jeremias. Starring Jason Patrick as Michael Emerson, Corey Hain as Sam Emerson, Kiefer Sutherland as David, and Corey Feldman as Edgar Frog. While I'm personally not as crazy about The Lost Boys as the majority of the people are, it's still an enjoyable movie, but definitely not one as good when compared to the other films being discussed today. There's just nothing to it, and it's and the entire movie is executed in such a glamorizing way that it's hard to be taken seriously. That being said, it's still an enjoyable popcorn film to me, but that's all it'll ever be. This film did more for the Corey's careers than it did for the subgenre. And that's really my take on Lost Boys. I'm kind of a, I mean, I don't hate it, uh, but I don't love it either. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, that being said, what do you think of this? Thank Christ you said that, because I feel the exact same way. Yes! I, I had seen it at, a, at an age when everybody was talking about it, and everybody was like, oh, The Lost Boys is The Lost Boys, that, oh, if you want to see Vampire Film, watch The Lost Boys. And I genuinely rewatched it thinking, I, again, basing it on age, that maybe some stuff went over my head, and maybe I didn't see something, that, you know, didn't appreciate it at the time. So I did rewatch it. And I felt the exact same way. So I was like, you know what, Elena, trust your first instinct. You're not going to see anything different this time uh, than you did the first time. I think it's been glorified in a way that it's just, it's everywhere. It's kind of like one of those things that's shoved down your throat and everybody's like, you have to see this. And maybe out of spite, you're secretly going, I'm not going to like this. But it's, um, that's how I felt with it. Like, uh, it was the cast. It was just, you know, different comments. G- certain girls are, like, mad about it because they think the boy is cute. Or it's just one of those things. Like, it, it doesn't stand out to me uh, any differently than 
what makes it special than the uh, again like you said the other films i think were way better than this like it like there was nice like little things like the way that they fly or you know not showing them it's just that, that those scenes were cool and i hate i, that. Did, uh, I hate i hate i hate how they fly and you never see it and shit it's yeah. weird uh, I, I saw I saw a poster where they're all kind of floating over the city. Like, isn't that's one thing that I've noticed about this film? It's like even though it's not, I didn't like it. I'm sure a lot of people do like it, evidently, because at every con that I've been to, there's like a whole section of like Lost Boys like posters and things to do with them. Like out of um, all of them, like I, I've never seen any action figures to do or you know like big sections on near dark or something like that as opposed to um pile of blast boy stuff i know a friend of mine he if he listens to this he'll be so pissed off he's from england and he has like a rumpus room or whatever you want to call it and he's a pool table in it and he has a whole wall of like just Kiefer sutherland or whatever in, in like lost mm-hmm. boy stuff and i i get it like it, it's a cool film it's a but i don't i don't get the the cult classic kind of you know people say um, you need to watch this film. It's a cult classic. You know, you have to appreciate it for what it is. But honestly, I did, like, I really didn't. Like, it was kind of, um, I will say the one redeeming thing I really liked was the music. And I actually immediately downloaded the song yesterday because I forgot that I actually really liked the theme. <laughs> yeah, the um, theme's not bad. Not. It really isn't. The Cry Little Sister. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. That's, yeah, that's what I liked. Sister. It's not bad. But otherwise, like, I did like the kind of showdown. That's the kind of redeeming thing it had from the aspect of, you know, the, the bathtub full of holy water and the garlic and the, and the squirt guns. That's kind of like the Goonies vibe. It, like, that was kind of cool that way. That's and, all you I know, the kid, it. That's it. That's the, it. The yeah. kids driving the car. And uh, mm-hmm. I just say, like, uh, Diane Weist is... Yeah, Grandpa is brilliant. Like, Diane, Diane Weist, am I saying her name right? Correct. West or Weist? Weist, yeah, Weist. Uh, yeah, yeah, Weist. She she kind of pissed me off. Like, she was just, like, her character kind of annoyed me. She wasn't, like, a cool mom. She just, like, really, like, annoying. So I didn't feel like I was being protected. Like, it's like I like watching scary films where, you know, the, the adults are kind of the defenders and they do anything to kind of save the kids. This one is just so stupid. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't like you. Um, but, like, it's like a twist within a twist and, no, like, no spoilers because that pissed me off royally. That's what I will touch on out of the, the laws of vampire stuff that I've now learned from watching back to back vampire films, like the ones that you remember that you can't invite, they can't come in unless you invite them in. Right. And, you know, holy water and garlic and stuff. And then they do this test on the dude and somehow he passes the test. And like, I, after watching the other ones, you're like, so how come they worked on the other ones? But this yeah, guy is somehow, it's selective, some, exactly. like, yeah. So that pissed me off <laughs> again. So uh, that was that aspect. But yeah, the song saved it for me. And I'm going to probably piss off a lot of people because a lot of people do love um, The Lost Boys. And there is oh, a lot people, of merch. Uh, and, I mean, especially here in the States, people go apeshit for that movie. I'll never understand it, but they freaking love The Lost Boys. Right. Oh, no, no. Grandpa, as you said, he touched on him. Just he's lying about this town. <laughs> so many bad yeah. parts. That was and just like it's cool. the thing that's, about the movie that's bothered me, and it's not really, it's got nothing to do with the movie itself. It's actually the fact that, um, um, are you familiar with actress Kelly Jo Minter? I do, not my five. She, you know her, you know, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, as I'm like, I, I've met her once, but I wouldn't have met her as much as the other ones. She was in Chicago, oh. okay, yeah, because I was gonna say Elm Street Five, probably that's how you know her, but yeah. um, she's in this movie, she has, she's in the credits. You see her in the background in one scene, but her entire role was cut. Like she had like three scenes. She worked at the um, at the store where Diane Weist gets the job working for um, Ed- Edward Herman's character, uh, his little electronic shop on the boardwalk or whatever it is that he that he does. She gets the job working there. Kelly oh. Joe Minter is actually one of the employees as well. You actually see her in one, maybe two scenes in the background, but as far as dialogue and everything else, got cut. Cutting room floor. Bullshit. Oh, that's kind of shit. Like, it's yeah. like, it's, yeah. you, you can't really. No well, you can put, either. She was never but, given a reason. You can put it on your CV, I suppose, but still, <laughs> it's like, that's kind of shit. <laughs> it's weird. And like, I, and it, 
the reason I, I wrote about this is because not that I really give a shit about the Lost Boys enough to warrant watching a documentary or anything like that, but I was watching the movie just last year, last, last summer actually, when I watched it the last, and her name comes up in the credits, and I'm like, wait, what the hell? Like, I've never noticed this before. Like, Kelly Jo Mentor, like, where is she at in this movie? And then I watched it, and didn't see her once, and sure enough, there her name is again in the end, end credits. So I had to do some researching, and sure enough, I came across a couple articles confirming what had happened, and I'm like, wow, that is Bush League. Holy crap. Yeah, so, well, maybe she's kind yeah. of thankful in a way that she isn't in it, because it's I mean, not good. She, I, I know, but she still <laughs> had the credit. It's not like she was killed off or anything. I think she's just a secondary, like, like she's just in, like, three scenes working at the shop with Diane Weist. Other than that, and I think there's one scene, there's a still that I saw with her flirting with Alex Winter's character. But right. other than that, she's just like, I mean, she got the credit still, so she probably still got paid because of that. I don't know how the uh, the, the director's guild and all that works, or the um, SAG, or whatever the hell that is. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, there's, her name's still in the credits, but she's nowhere to be seen. So, and I never understood that. It's just weird as hell. But um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> the, and like I said in my little thing, like. I swear this movie did more for the Corys than the horror genre at all. Like it really didn't help and it didn't really bring in anyone new to the genre. Really it didn't do any favors in general because the people that did see this back in 87 were people who subscribed to teen beat and were all about the Haim and Corey Fel- uh, Corey Feldman and Corey Haim and Jason Patrick and Kiefer Sutherland. It was just, it, it was glamorizing and it was nothing scary about the movie. I mean, 100%. Joel Schumacher directed it and he went on to direct Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. So, that's all yeah. I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I actually, I will say that Batman Forever is better than that film. Batman Forever stands out to me because I'm a huge Nicole Kidman fan. But <laughs> I will rather watch Batman uh, Forever than watch The Lost Boys again. <laughs> so, nice. uh, I'm right. sorry. How about, I'm... How about no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, It's like, it ain't horrible. It's watchable. But it's it's nothing more than a popcorn flick. As far as, like, the overall spectrum of the genre, of the subgenre, it does no favors for it. It's It, adds, it brings nothing to the table. It's just... It, it was just a it was basically a big company like Warner Brothers who wanted to get in on the vampire game. That's all this movie is. And uh yeah. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna leave Lost Boys at that. Now that we've done talking about our movies that we wanted to talk about. Now we're making pretty good timing too. Um just a few things breaking down before we wrap up. So like I just said, the most successful one of them. I mean, the. I didn't say to say that. Never mind. So the most, <laughs> the most successful of these five movies, obviously, Lost Boys. And going down, looking at these totals and whatnot, um, we have The Hunger, which made we don't know if it made money because I couldn't get a budget on that. But Vamp, Vamp turned in a profit, not a big one, but a profit. Near Dark lost money. Lost Boys brought in lots of money, obviously. Fright Night brought in a pretty penny too, but not as much as Lost Boys, unfortunately. Um, and with looking at these numbers, they don't really tell me much because this is horror, and we know how horror gets treated overall. Um, so let's just get into it, talking about which one is our favorite and why? And I believe like we, we both knew the answer because I think we already answered this question while we were talking about it. Kind of, I, I think I can speak for you when I say near dark for both of us. Wasn't that it? Or do you have a favorite? Uh, I, I'm or, or is yours Fright Night? Yeah, I'm going to actually say Fright Night. As much as I really love near dark, the two of them, if I, I could choose, but they're both kind of um different kind of styles like if that makes sense it's kind of like i like this one because of this and i like that one because of that but if i I had to pick i definitely i think fright night just kind of speaks to me on a on a whole 80s vibe level um in a kind of just traditional sense like it's kind of just the the one vampire 
let's go defeat the one vampire and yet have a bit of fun about it at the same time. And it was the effects, I think, that really got me for that one. And just the fact that, like, he's so cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, definitely. All right. Um... But I will say I really enjoyed New Dark, just the cast, the acting, the effects, and that is is cool too. But it's a, dar- it's a darker aspect. I think you have to be in a, in a mood to watch it. It speaks for all of them anyway, but... Just, I think you can throw on Fright Night at any time because you know you're not going to be. It kind of. Um, you're right. I don't know right what that. it is. It's it's yeah, a, right. it's lighter right. in a way if that makes sense. Yeah, you're right. Because I because what it is 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 just near dark. As great as it is, it does take itself. It does take itself a little seriously. Whereas Fright Night, it's like, come on, we know what this is. Have fun, you know. Right. Um. So. Let me ask you this, and we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Um, the subgenre, vampires, it's um, it's declined. Do you do you agree that it's declined over the years? Yeah, I, I do agree with that. Oh, but I think it's kind of like people are at the stage where they kind of think everything has been done, so they're kind of afraid to do it again. Like without, there's nothing new you can possibly bring to it but then again someone proved me wrong <laughs> when I say this I'm sure someone will try but uh, it definitely horror in general seems to kind of try and stay away from all the 80s things because it has been done and I think we're at a phase where it's like um, based on true stories or you know kind of like more paranormal mm-hmm. aspects to it but I, I think it has toned down a bit like I don't I don't think there has been any well, when I say that, I, I did mention American Horror Story um, season five, and that did touch on it uh, without going too overboard of, you know, ripping things off, like completely copying things. I think that you would call them homages or homages. But homages, um, that's, yeah, that's the only thing that I can think of in the last while, in the last couple of years that I've seen that um <clears throat> that have something to do with vampires besides obviously the really cool um tribute episode <laughs> yeah. of the simpsons the simpsons halloween special that's my favorite halloween special is where they take the piss out of bram stoker's um dracula tree house of terror yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure that episode with mr burns is the vampire that's like my favorite yeah. halloween special nice now i wrote down on all well, my notes here i wrote down seven words it's all action film no <laughs> heart. Because it is. And, and and I also put in parentheses, Twilight didn't help. Um, oh, God. Yeah, I didn't even mention that because Twilight I actually hate it. did not do this <laughs> genre any freaking favors at all. You know, and I mentioned it briefly when we're talking about Near Dark because, I don't know, it's like whoever wrote Twilight definitely got their inspiration from Near Dark. Had to have. Had to have watched Neo Dark at some point and was like, I like this idea. I'm going to make this into something. They had to have because it's like the same story I almost. Um, not that I'm a big Twilight fan. I've never even seen any of the movies. It's just I know what they're about, basically. And and it's it's, it's similar plots, really, it is. Um, but like I said, it's all action films of no heart. You've got, I mean, I think there's a freaking... Morbius film coming out next year, this year of Jared Leto. That's a vampire comic book character who's like Blade. And speaking of Blade, we got a Blade movie coming out from Marvel in the next couple of years. And that to okay. me is is that's what the genre is now with vampires. It's all action stuff and CG and you know when was the last great vampire movie you watched? You know, it's that's that's a you no. Know, you know, that's, that's that's basically what I feel the genre has has become in the last over the last ten years or so. And that's you know. that's funny when you mentioned Morbius because um that uh, an image just popped into my head of um not that I'm big on superheroes but I remember the animated series of Spider Man and I for some reason that just popped into my head where the the guy I think he was Morbius he was like a vampire dude um, yep, that's he bites talking. him. And then he he turns dark or whatever. Like, that just popped into my head. I haven't thought about that episode since I was, like, six. <laughs> That's weird. But, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. And finally, where do you see the subgenre in the next ten years from now? Down the road, another decade ahead, 
Do you see it making a comeback? Do you see it remaining the same? Do you see it just continue to be ignored by the overall GP? Like, where do you just honestly, how do you feel about it? Where do you think it's going to be in 10 years if you can do that? Honestly, I, I don't know. Like, I'm actually afraid, to be honest, because everybody's remaking everything. So uh, even though you did say there, there is, you know, rumors of like remaking Near Dark and and um, the others again, like for some reason, I just feel it in my soul that people will have no new ideas and jump on the train of let's remake everything because we have no new ideas and nobody will care. But clearly we all will and we'll all be very angry. But I have a feeling that's what's going to happen. If not, there's going to be a few more tv shows with references i don't see anything pivotally new um that's what i feel for 10 years then again someone could prove me completely wrong and do it on um, <laughs> on a whole new level that i haven't seen before like i don't know i really don't but I, I like to be optimistic and have hope and you never know there could be like a really new hit um, right. show that hasn't been done even though there has been a few <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I want to piggyback off of that. I want to be optimistic myself. Um, however, it's kind of hard. And I never really, I didn't really think about that, but you're right. Probably in 10 years, we're going to be seeing remakes of a handful of these movies we talked about today. And that's unfortunate. And I, I really want to hope that in 10 years from now, we get back to some serious vampire movies. Hell. Give us some more werewolf movies. We haven't seen those in a while. Um, but yeah, I, I can just, all I can do in the next 10 years is hope. Just like we both. That's all we can do is hope for something good and no remakes. <laughs> Yay. Yay, <laughs> hope. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that's, uh, that concludes this episode, which I didn't think we we're going to be able to get done. But holy hell, we did it. We did it. We did it. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> um, before we get out of here, we'll let everyone know that we will be back next week with not one but two episodes. I got one that I just recorded earlier coming to you guys on Tuesday. We're going to be talking about The Fifth Element from 1997. And then on Friday, Mads will be back on the show, and her and I will be talking about the 20th anniversary of The Fast and the Furious. We've got a couple of different films next week. A lot different from the films we talked about today. Um, that being said, I want to remind everyone to check out previous episodes of the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google, Pandora, iHeartRadio, and wherever else you enjoy your favorite shows. Follow us along on Facebook.com at Mad Dad Movie Review, Instagram.com at Mad Dad Movie Review, YouTube.com at Mad Dad Movie Review, and Twitter.com at Mad Dad Movie Pod. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, or requests, always email them to Mad Dad Movie Review at gmail.com. Elena, thank you so much for doing this episode with me today. It has been fun and exciting. I really enjoyed talking to you, and I'm so glad you. We're finally able to find the time to do this. We could do this. Um, thank you so much again for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Ed. I had great crack, as they say. I, I don't know <laughs> if I actually officially taught you that phrase, but when you say, what's the crack, it means what's up. But you can use it in sentences like crack means fun. So you're having the exactly. crack, and I had great crack. So yes, you had some great crack. Outstanding crack. <laughs> yes. Awesome, Outstanding awesome. crack. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, let's do this again sometime. I'll stay in touch, of course. You know, we always keep in touch between Mad Dad and uh, Crazy Train Radio. So uh, it's, this was a fun episode. And again, thank you so much for coming on here today. Thank you so much, Ed. Have a great one. You too. Take care. Bye. See ya. You can escape.